Hi everyone, welcome to the Inbound Studio. I'm Laura Moran, joined by Troy Carter. This is uh, more like it. This is a little more cozy, yeah, a little I, I more I feel like intimate. I'm with my friends now. <laughs> Woo. It's a big room. The main stage is pretty big, yes. pretty big. Uh, thank you so much for being here at Inbound with us. Oh, of course. Um, I want to jump right in uh, with the investing side of things, actually. And I forgive me if I'm repeating things that have already been repeated on the main stage, but um, you're invested. You, I'll give you the real story here. Excellent. That's we're what we want. Friends. You're invested in so many companies that at early stage, you invested at an early point of companies that have done so well. Warby Parker, Dropbox, Uber, Spotify, Lyft. Um, in general, that's a good success rate. But what do you, what do you look for and how are you sort of finding the, the nooks and crannies of what's going to work when you look at companies uh, at a startup phase? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think you kind of like with anything else is like, you know, you go in not knowing a lot and then you kind of learn from mistakes and you sort of develop almost an internal uh, compass for what, what, work, what, what works, what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you start getting more right than you get than you get wrong. But I think more than anything else, I think I, I have a really good feel for people. Mm -hmm and um, a really good bullshit detector is like mm -hmm. a, my West Philly Spidey senses. <laughs> and, um, and I think being in music and specifically in, in hip hop is like you gotta know how to read rooms yeah. and you gotta know how to finesse things and understand people. And sitting in the rooms when people are pitching you, um, you just learn to ask the right questions. And, and for me, um, I invest through the lens of a consumer. Mm -hmm. So I kind of want to ask very basic questions. And, you know, my diligence process is totally different from, you know, a, 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 a more institutional firm. But I just ask really basic questions. How does, a, how does the product work? Who's going to buy it? How do you acquire customers? Um, what does the competitive landscape look like? Um, and why, you know, like, why are you uniquely qualified to take this on, mm -hmm. you know, and understanding entrepreneurs and like kind of what mm -hmm. makes them tick, mm -hmm. you know, you can kind of find out, you know, whether this person uh, would be qu qualified to get it over the finish line because it's hard. Yeah. Has that spidey sense always been there for you or is that something that you've honed over time? No, it's, it's, it's been there like and all, all jokes aside, like, you know, you really come in, come, coming up in like a tough neighborhood and everything, you really got to have good instincts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, whether it's, you know, and for me, it's been like real situations, like living through the whole Tupac Biggie thing and music and mm -hmm. East Coast, West Coast and music. Going into a lot of these rooms as a promoter, you got to know, okay, who has a gun? Yep. And which guy is really going to use the gun? Yep. You know, who's real, who's not real? And all of those instincts is like you, when, when they're hardwired into you, it is applicable to everything else. Mm -hmm. You know, because in, in our world, you know, I talked on stage about getting screwed out of a, in a contract, you know, by not having a contract. Okay. Dummy, next time have a contract. He will never not have <laughs> yeah, a contract. Yeah, so it's like you, it's certain things you just learn it, you learn as you go. But, um, but I think instinct for me has gotten me further than anything, than, than anything else. As you talked about, you know, you talked about being sort of like a reader of people. That's where you draw uh, your lines when you're thinking about companies and people to invest in. Can you talk a little bit about how that has worked with artists as well and how you're sort of picking and choosing what will make a successful artist, I guess? Yeah, you know, it, it's a, it, it's, they have a lot in common. Sure. And that, that's why I think it was a natural transition, mm -hmm. you know, because it, it's, the music industry is just, it's very hard. It's like, you know, when you look at the amount of people who actually make it, and then you go to that sort of 0.1% who become superstars, it's really difficult. And for me, investing time is more important than even investing money. Mm -hmm. You can't get the time back. 
So when we invest in artists, you know, we got to spend three years usually n not knowing whether they're going to make it or not, because yeah, yeah, we, don't, sure. we don't typically sign superstars at my company. We actually start working with artists from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So it's a really serious investment of time that you, you have to make and the sort of opportunity costs that you give up by investing the time in the artist, you better develop a good sense of, you know, mm -hmm. who's, gonna, who's gonna work. And a lot of times I look at, what have you done to kind of get your career to this point? Yep. What do you sacrificed? Yep. You know, um, and now you can look at things like, you know, if an artist comes and, you know, is no Instagram or, or no SoundCloud or it's just nothing, I, I just think like maybe this person's just lazy. They're not even trying at this point or whatever, you know, because everything's free. It's no barrier to entry. So I just want to be able to see that you got that thing in you that's going to get you. Because when, because it, 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 it's this moment of this is, if for artists, this is the moment of this is the hardest thing I've ever done. Mm -hmm. I really want to quit. Why am I doing this? The press is bashing me right now. Mm -hmm. um, people hate this song or, or hate this album. Um, all of my friends have changed. My relationship with my family has changed. Mm -hmm. I can't walk out of my house not fully dressed oh, anymore yeah. and people are sneaking pictures of me. I don't know if this is true love or not. If this person, w they go through a, tr a tremendous amount of things and so to keep going, you have to be hardwired a certain way. Mm -hmm. And when you look at companies, you know, um, uh, Travis from Uber, you know, is, you know, we, uh, Travis is Travis. <laughs> Travis isn't running Uber anymore for a reason. Yeah. But to get it to that point, it took somebody who was going to drive a Mack truck through a cul-de-sac mm -hmm. and ignore regulation and break rules and all of these things to get it past the taxi industry, regulation, um, lobbyists, all of these things. It takes a certain type of personality to get it there. So, you know, so you're looking at entrepreneurs, what problem are you taking on? And do you have that personality to kind of take on that problem to get it over that hump? Do you have that personality? Oh my God, it's like, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, to a fault sometimes. <laughs> yeah, you know what, because it, it's, it's, in my mind, when people tell me no, it's like, it's almost that Scooby-Doo, like, you know, <laughs> hmm. like, you know, and it's like, all of a sudden, something kind of, you know, clicks for me. And then also, it's, you know, I think it's, you know, aren't you, a lot of successful entrepreneurs and definitely a lot of artists um, are, have so many flaws, right? So like what went wrong in your childhood that, you know, where you feel like you have to prove this? Yeah. Or have you taken so much abuse that, you know, like what some, like something is driving you to, um, to, to, to do this and what is it that, that's actually driving it? And you know, you hear a lot of fake stuff of, hey, I wanna change the world. No, you wanna prove that to your dad, <laughs> <laughs> that you can make it. Or was that ex-girlfriend or ex-boyfriend yeah. who let you down, called you a loser. It's like, <laughs> so it's like, you know, so, but I'm, I, for me, it's like, it's that thing that sometimes I wanna turn off mm -hmm. and just be on a farm in Martha's Vineyard and say, okay, <laughs> is, enough is enough. But it's this thing that just kind of keeps me going. I wanna talk a little bit about um, like disruption or disruptive technologies or companies, a lot of the businesses that you have invested in have disrupted a space that they're in. Spotify, which you were at. Um, Today's for, my last day. Congratulations. I took off work, to be with you guys. <laughs> You're last, here with us. Last day at work, nobody shows up. <laughs> um, but you know, Spotify looked at the music industry and was like, uh, they're not keeping up with what they need to keep up with. And you joined and, you know, I know you've been outspoken about that piece of it. How, you know, what was attractive to you about that? Or what is attractive to you about um, companies and, and businesses that are 
finding their way, you know, the, the side door into something that's not happening the right way or answering a need that is clearly there that no one else is doing something about. It, you know, it's, it's, I love businesses where there, there, there's almost an unsurmountable barrier to entry. Mm -hmm. And um, because once you get over the barrier, it makes it hard for other people to compete. And Spotify had, you know, Daniel Lex specifically had done something that was incredibly difficult to do, and that was get, to get music companies to license the music globally and to be able to do it on a, a, an ad supported tier. And like, he waited two years bef um, before he actually launched the company. And most people who, got in, who tried to build technology companies and music stole the music first <laughs> and then asked for permission. Yeah. And the record labels got into, you know, into litigation with them. But I think they liked Daniel because he took this approach of, I'm going to prove my model in the Nordics. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna show you guys that it works, and they basically eradicated piracy, and you know, in Sweden and some of the other Nordic territories, and proved it out. So it was a trust that he built with um, with the record labels, and um, and he had to have the patience of Job to deal with the amount of personalities that you have to deal with, yeah. and the amount of rules and things they put in these contracts. So to be able to do it is like it took a certain type of person to be able to pull it off. So my bet was more, you know, on him. And I actually met Daniel on Scott Harrison, who spoke earlier, mm -hmm. did a trip to Ethiopia. And Daniel and I were on a trip to Ethiopia and spending a week and a half in villages and yeah. back of Range Rovers going through mountains yeah. and singing by campfires <laughs> and like you get to know people. So right. I knew him on that level without a shower for a week <laughs> before, you know, we actually had done any sort of real, any business yeah. together. I mean, to that point, you know, the music industry or entertainment really at large seems like one where like you got to know people to keep going. Um, how has mentorship played a role in your career and perhaps how have you been a mentor to others after having, you know, seen success? Yeah, I got, I got really, really lucky. You know, um, like I said, J you know, James Lasseter, who's one of my closest friends and, you know, he was, he was still to this day Will Smith's manager from 30 years ago and he only got hired as a manager because he's the only guy in the neighborhood with a car. <laughs> and, and Jazzy Jeff had to get his equipment moved around to, to house parties. And James, though, he took, he like, I call him for problems. And Jimmy Iovine has given me some of the best advice I've ever gotten in my personal life. You know, he's a father of four. And, you know, be, being a young father in this business, I had my first kid when I was 22. And, um, you know, I've gotten some great advice. And still to this very day, is certain people I can call on when, you know, um, I'm trying to figure something out and that's still there. And, um, and I do that for a lot of other young managers. I do it for artists. That's what I enjoyed about my time at Spotify because as a manager within my own company, you know, at max, I think I've, I probably had 15 clients because we had such a, you know, boutique business. Mm -hmm. And, um, but at Spotify, I felt like I could talk to so many artists around the world, so many young managers. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I, I enjoy doing it. And I learn a lot from, from, from young people who are entering the business today yeah. because they're much smarter at streaming, at breaking artists. So things where, you know, where I feel like my generation of managers disconnected from is a whole new generation that are just much smarter than us. What would you say at the core of it all just like drives the work you do? What, what keeps getting you out of bed every morning? What gets you so excited about the artists that you work with, the businesses that you work with? I think it's curi curiosity. Like I, I just, um, I'm sort of like a, a perpetual learner. Like when, um, so when I, I used to cut school and I would go to the libraries. <laughs> like, it's like, and, that does not make yeah. sense. <laughs> like, and it's, it's, but it's, it's, this, it's this sort of thing, like when I want to learn about something, I become obsessed yeah. with the topic, and I want to know every single thing there is to know 
about that particular topic. So I, I cold call people still to this very day. I'll email random people. I'll ask for meetings. Um, on Wednesday, I'm going to Nairobi, um, Nairobi, Ghana, and Tanzania just to meet with entrepreneurs. The whole mm -hmm. purpose of the trip, I, I won't meet with anybody I know, mm -hmm. um, is all people who I don't know, never met before. And the idea is to be more exploratory. And then I'm going to do the same thing in China before the end of the year. But just the new ideas, what's happening locally, what people are working on. And that sort of thing just kind of drives me. Um, knowing all of this, knowing where you've been, looking back, what advice would you give to your teenage self? Probably um, the importance of relationships. Mm -hmm. I broke a lot. I was a bull in a china shop in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, it, and it was... I learned how to do business by, list, as James's assistant, I used to have to roll phone calls for him and mm -hmm. listen to the other end of the, of the call. And it was so different from everything I thought I knew about <laughs> business. Because I'm like, why is, they're still talking about their kids. Like, get to the point. <laughs> you know, so I thought it was gonna be this sort of transactional thing. Yeah. And so in the very beginning, it's like I treated it very transactional. And it took some patience. Um, and Jimmy Iovine was the guy who basically said, look, if you want, uh, you guys that can do this wrong and blow up your entire career, or if you want to do this right, I'll show you how to do this mm -hmm. right. So, and, and then the patience piece you know, I think it's the gift and the curse. It's like, you know, you, you're driven because things aren't happening fast enough. But, you know, it's, um, you know, I, I've, I think I've learned and, it's, it, and it may sound, it may sound weird because it's a little quick story. You know, I, I got in this group a record deal and I was broke at the time, but I had this relationship with a record company. And these kids asked, you know, these guys asked if I could help shop their record deal. So I got them a deal. And the, uh, the whole deal was, OK, you get this commit, the advance money, you're going to give me this commission. And you know, it, I was you know, living with my girlfriend at the time. We had this young, uh, young son. And I saw one of the guys downtown. Um, and he had shopping bags. Says, hey, you look like new money or whatever. So they had gotten this money and burnt me out of the money. And I called the record company and found out they burnt me out of the money. So I never forget, I was in Baltimore because Will, Will Smith was shooting this movie, Enemy of the State. And I'm in his trailer and I'm on the phone cursing out the guy <laughs> on the other end of the phone about this $6,000 commission. And Will's in the background telling me to hang up the phone. So I hung up and he said, let it go. <laughs> I said, let it go. Like, like I, was, I already wrote checks against it. Yeah. You know, and it's easy for you to say, let when, it go. Yeah. And he was teaching me this lesson and he told me, you got to let go to grow sometimes. And you can hang on to this energy and you can stick with this energy or you can trust that everything happens for the greater good. Mm -hmm. And I never listened to him. Like, I was still fighting <laughs> over this commission. <laughs> still fighting over this commission. But through the years, I learned in different situations. And, you know, on the st main stage, you know, I talked about the Eve situation. And in all honesty, you know, I felt really burned and upset. Yeah. And, but I refused. I didn't file a lawsuit. I didn't do anything like that. And all my creditors, I called, I didn't I refused to file for bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And each creditor, I kept a list written down of everybody I owed money. And I called them and let them know my situation. And every time a check came in, I would pay down a little bit, mm -hmm. just a little bit on each one. And I would check off anyone that got paid. I would just check off until finally everything got checked off. 
And I've realized and I learned being able to put that energy back out there, mm -hmm. to be able to put good energy, these goodwill deposits, they, it absolutely works. And to be able to tell my younger self, trust that, invest in that, and really trust that thing that it works. And even during those difficult times, when it really doesn't feel like it's gonna work, really understanding that, you know what, is, is, is the way the world works. Yep. 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 I could sit here and talk all day, but we're out of time. <laughs> so we have to end it. Um, but I have one final question before we're done. You've been on the main stage. Thank you for coming. You've been here. What does inbound mean to you? You know what? I didn't get a chance to spend um, a lot of time. It, but, you know, and what was impressive to me was just the the makeup of the audience and then the lineup of the participants. And you know, you uh, and you get a re you get requests uh, like for a lot of different type types of things or whatever. And you know, we got five kids, so I'm like, I, I I'm gonna pick and choose what yeah. I what I traveled and do. But when I saw sort of saw, okay, you got. Scott, you got, you know, media execs, you got, it's like the, the mixture and makeup of participants to me just says a lot of, sort of about the, the culture of the organization. And then the other piece that I noticed is that this is the most well-run conference that I've gone to. Uh, definitely one of the most well-produced, but also just the nature of the people from the time I got in a car to come over mm -hmm. all the way, you know, up until now, mm -hmm. you could tell that the, the, the culture that you guys are building with an inbound is great culture. Well, thank you yeah. so much. Cool. That, that means a lot and it's uh, very kind of you to say, but thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for coming to the studio and maybe we'll have you back again. Cool. cool. Thank that you for having great. me. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.